Hey, Jesse, how's it going? I'm doing well, Ben. Good to hear you and see you. It's good to hear and see you as well. You're coming to us live from where in the world are you right now? Brussels, which is in Belgium for those who may not know this. Brussels, Belgium. So it is 11.30 a.m. my time. What time is it there in Brussels? Uh, at the end of our working day, it's 5.30. So people are starting to get home and, and I will do so after this as well, for sure. Well, I appreciate you staying late for us here. Thank you so much. Pleasure. And uh, for those of you who don't know, who are tuning in right now, um, you know, people maybe in the States or something, or maybe uh, in other parts of the industry that don't know, um, Jesse Van Sass is the uh, Secretary General of FIDI. Um, Jesse, can you give us a real quick, uh, what is FIDI? Okay, FIDI is, is, is what you would call a federation or an association. It depends on where in the world you are. It's um, an association for international movers, and it's been there for um, quite a number of years, 70 years. That's 7-0. That means that with, I think we're the oldest association for movers in the world, global one. Uh, so it started in 1950, and ever since it's been uh, slowly growing to what it is today. Um, but I'll explain more about this. I can talk for hours on FIDI only. Uh, but FIDI is located in Brussels um, uh, this time, has always been located in Brussels. And I think that right now we have 612 members, or affiliates wow. as we call them, uh, worldwide in about 102 countries, I believe. So we're widespread around the world with all with what we call quality movers because they're all quality certified. Otherwise, you cannot be in FIDI. I want to talk about both of those topics real quick. Um, I want to do a, a quick little roll call. So please go ahead and leave your name, your company and where in the world you are. I'd love to hear from you. Also, if you have any comments or questions for Jesse, we'll uh, be glad to take some of those. So, you know, I love giving you guys shout outs. We're coming to you a little earlier than we normally do if you're in the States. Uh, we're coming to you uh, a little earlier than we do. A lot of times we get a lot of people tuning in from uh, the UK. And uh, usually they like to watch us in the pub, I've been told. And I think we might be just a little pub premature right now. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you're coming to us, uh, if you're if you're watching us right now, tuned in, please leave a little love. Hit that hand clap button. Hit the uh, like button. Let us know you're out there. And uh, John, John, Chris, good to see you, Ben and Jesse. Good to see you too, John. All right. So we got 22 people trickling in right now. All right. Sounds good. We got some good. folks uh, tuning in to us here from... Uh, from Facebook, Janet Turner, my girl at Accelerated International Forwarders, remote working in sunny Florida. We got uh, we got household goods drivers coming into us. Steve Miser, look at this. We got such a great little representation of the industry. So you were telling us uh, just before I kind of cut you off here. Tell me a little bit about the history of Feedy. Okay, well, Feedy started as a. Um, you have to imagine movers back in the fifties when they had an international shipment going to the other side of the world. They had no clue where to go. So there was no email. There were no no phone. Well, there was a bit of phones, but not really working. So it was all by 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 documentation and sending it by post. Wow. What they needed, of course, was a partner on the other side of the world. And uh, that's not easy to select some of those partners. So very quickly, there was that need to form a network of movers so they can meet each other, talk to each other, and select who they'll be working with in Singapore or in the US or in Africa, wherever it is. And this is where Feedy really started in the 1950s as a gathering of movers to form a network. And it's been a network for, for many, many years. And of course, gradually, we've added another few service elements, and I can talk about that later. But the networking was always a backbone of Fidi, and it only changed about 20 years ago when Fidi said, great, we've got like 800 plus members. It's all going well, but we need to put some meat on the bones here. It's, it's time to do something different. And this is where Fidi decided that from now on, only quality certified companies can be part of Fidi. Quality certified, not because you say that you do quality, but because you actually prove it. To we have market. this problem. I'm going to stop you right here because we have this problem here in the United States, right? Uh -huh. So sales guys like me with our pretty suits and our PowerPoint presentations, we walk into boardrooms across the United States and we tell everybody what a quality mover we are, right? And yeah. we add these little logos to our emails about all our quality awards and everything like that. Some people call them vanity awards, all sorts of stuff, right? Uh -huh. But we don't have... Well, I don't want to say we don't have because Feedy does this, but I mean, in the United States for domestic movers, we don't have a lot of widespread quality certifications. Yes, there's Feedy, yes, there's ISO, but these are tend to be more global standards that are used globally and with international shipping companies, mm -hmm. but they're not typically used domestically. And I'd love to hear how you do quality. And I'd love to hear thoughts on how, you know, domestic movers in the United States can, can utilize some of the same principles. 
hey, you're giving me ideas, so that's uh, fantastic. Thank you very much. Maybe we'll look into that one day. But right now, we're focusing on global, uh, definitely. So how do we do quality? And, and I must admit that when we started 20 years ago with the first FAME standard, and FAME back then stood for FIDI Accredited International Mover, that standard back then does not look anymore like the standard we have today. It has changed vastly because, of course, our customers are changing and their requirements are changing. The way we, we prove quality is that, well, first of all, a company will have to go through the FAME standard and make sure that they can uh, live up to that minimum standard that we uh, require for them. And then, of course, after they've done that and they're ready to become a FIDI member or to prove their fame, that's when we send an auditor to them. And the auditor is not us. It's a third party. It's, it's Ernst & Young. Uh, it's a guy or a girl who will come to the office and actually start checking around whether whatever you say you are doing, you are actually doing. So they come to your office and they start snooping around and making yeah. sure that you're actually doing what you say you're doing. And like, what kinds of things are they, are they checking? Well, you know, it started off 20 years ago with lots of operational stuff. You say you have a truck. Well, let's go and see your truck. Is there a truck? Does, is, our, is all the documentation in order? The insurance okay? Is it still valid? That kind of stuff. And, and if you see a mover walking around, say, hey, who are you? Oh, yes, you're, you're John Doe. Great. Are you on the, 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 the personnel register? Are you there? Are you actually working there? Um, is there access control? Do you have cartons that you use? It was very operational back then. And, and gradually we put in other elements into the, uh, in, into the uh, fame, like for example, um, anti-bribery, anti-corruption management, anti-trust management. Wait, time out, we're not allowed to do that? Sorry? We're not allowed to do that? Apparently not, you're not allowed to do that. <laughs> it's a, it's a it's fun thing in, in this in business. Yeah. But it's elements that we put into. And what an auditor then does is that anything you've said, whether that's actually true, for example, if, and I'll give you just an example, if you have a great, beautiful sign on, on, on the wall of your office saying, we are green. It's a great statement. They will say, great, you are green, fantastic. Show me what you mean by that. Have you had meetings on this with the board? Have you had meetings with your staff? Are you telling your customers about it? Are you telling your, your supply chain about it? So we're actually going to check that. This goes really far in a sense that at a certain moment, and I've been through those fame audits as a mover myself in the past, about four of them, at a certain moment, the auditor will say, I'm now going to select 10 files at random. So you show them all the files you have. Back then they were on paper. Later on, they were online. They're going to select 10 files and they go through them from A to Z completely to check everything in there and see if it makes sense. And you, and it's, it's a great uh, tool to, to really audit because as a mover, you know, there's always certain files that you don't want them to take and you usually find those files somehow. Well, I don't know how that always happens, but in any case, so what they do, for example, they have a customer and in the, in the, in the file, they see that there's a complaint from the customer. Well, you've said earlier that you have a complaint register as you should have. They will then say, well, can you show me a register that indeed this customer has been noted in there as a complaint and what you've done with it? So they check really everything. Did you tell your supply chain when you gave the order to, to, to get packing crews or whatever, that you have an anti-bribery and, and, and corruption uh, uh, charter that you have signed and that you actually impose on them as well, that you have data protection, et cetera. So they really go far in checking in the files, and this is the, most, the strongest point of, of fame, to check whether you are, do, or you are doing what you say that you are doing. I'd like to hear from anybody that's watching us right now. We got about we got about 40, 40 folks on LinkedIn right now uh, live. I'd like to hear what your thoughts are on a corporate. So the military does these types of audits for mm -hmm. us. They'll go through our files. They'll go through our vaults. They'll go through our shipments. Um, they go out on site. They send military inspectors out. But for our corporate movers, we I mean we have a pro mover standard through AMSA. But that's a self-certification. You usually get, you kind of get grafted into that if you're a part of a van line. It's kind of loosey-goosey, to be honest with you. Yeah. And um, I respect that. I respect that that exists, but we wanted to go a step further and get yeah. a third party in there. Well, the more the more teeth you have and the more um, validation and auditing and things that you have of that nature, the more people can take it seriously. Right? Absolutely. And so if you're watching this right now, I'd love to hear your thoughts on um, what we can do in the United States from a um, you know from an audit standpoint, what what aspects do you think should be audited? Um, I love how you're talking about. Do you actually have trucks? This is a major fundamental problem in the United States, mm -hmm. where we have. Gosh, I'm going to go out on a limb and say half the movers online on Google who are purchasing leads and calling consumers yeah. don't even own trucks. 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Or and don't even control drugs. So you don't need to own them. You could also control them, which is also a way to do that. Being a move manager, if you like. Well, they're fair, and they're but they're claiming to be carriers, and they're yeah. actually brokers, and that's a major issue, right? Yeah. Um, so so anyway, I, I'm loving this. Um, so you were you were talking a little bit about the the standards. Um, you talk about the standards. You have an auditor come in from Ernst and Young. Um, do you see this as being how how does this standard used by your by your member companies? I mean, how they go through this process and then what? And then what's the value to them? You know that has evolved over the years. Uh, you have to imagine twenty years back when we made that mandatory, and I told you we had over eight hundred members back then. We dropped back to five hundred overnight because we imposed a standard that not everybody could could do. So it's very courageous of Fidi to do that. I think back then. And then, of course, you start, people want to be part of the club because Fidi had a very good reputation as, as the elite club, if you like. So they want to be part of the club. And the most important thing that we try to convince our members is that they have to use that fame, not only to be part of the club, but to use it in their sales when they go to corporates or to the, to, to, to the end customers or to government co customers. Tell them about fame and tell them how you make a difference because you are actually all of it. And that took a long time to have in, convince all of our members to do so. Uh, they are doing this right now, and, and, and from Fidi, we try to promote this as much as we can by giving them a lot of tools so they can sell fame to, to their customers and actually make value of it. You know what, when I, and again, when I was a mover and I went for the first time through fame, I remember this very well. At first, for me, it was like a nuisance. It was a must-do because my boss said, I want to be part of Fidi, so you have to go through fame. So it was like a nuisance. I had to go through the quality manual, write a whole quality manual, and then check and do a self-assessment, et cetera, et cetera. Quite a nuisance. I discovered very quickly it was a great way to make changes in the company that I always wanted to do, but never had the courage or the, 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 the guts to do that. Now I could actually tell, hey, we have to. We got to change this. We, we got to put on paper what we're doing because we have to have fame. So from a nuisance, it became a great tool to make st structural changes in the company. Right, because now you have a mandate from your senior executive leadership Correct. to say, we need to be compliant with this. And oh, by the way, there's an ROI on it, right? Because now we can claim this. Now we can get all this business. And now here you are tucking in things that also make a lot of sense. Correct. And you're getting it passed through. That's great. So That's from great. a nuisance, it becomes a tool, and then you have to see the value. You have to turn it into a value. And this is where you go to your customers and tell them how proud you are to be FAME certified and what it actually uh, what it actually all means, what's what's behind this. Tell them about an auditor coming into your into your office, not just once, but you know, every three years. And there's self-assessments that you have to do, what we call internal audit every year. There's a financial assessment every year. So a lot of things that are happening to prove that you are a quality company. It doesn't mean you can't fail because hey, we're all humans. So things can go wrong sometimes, but at least there's a whole systems and there's processes behind this to make sure that whenever, whenever there's a failure, that there also, there's also a remedy. There's something happening after that. You don't run away from whatever happens. Sure. And, and that's important in the movie industry because something always happens, right? Yeah. So it's how do you handle hey, that for sure. But people, huh? Yeah, exactly. And we're moving household goods, right? So that's right. Um, I want to, I want to talk a little bit about, your well you had mentioned your you know starting out as a, as a mover i mean what is your relocation story how did you even end up in this business i think like everybody by accident you don't deliberately go to university and then go to 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 a moving company no. uh, by accident through uh, a, an no. uncle of my wife who worked for an international moving company in holland and that's when i started and i, I do admit the first few days i was completely uh, lost i had no idea what they were talking about with bill of lading and stuff like that i had no idea what i was talking about sure and I have a sales background, so I was in sales back then. This is going back 25, 26 years. Um, so mostly in sales. And it took about, I think for the average person, about half a year to a year when you realized I'm hooked to this business. I can't change anymore. It's because it's so international, so different from day to day, but mostly because it's so personal. It's, it's, it's very personal. We're talking about personal effects. Yes. Uh, uh, things right. that are, have no value for you and me, but for the owner, it has a huge value. And that's what people don't always realize. And that's when it really gets interesting. And when you start um, um, getting into the business and, and start to love it, uh, love and reload, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> so I've been in sales for a while. I moved back to Belgium uh, with my wife and kids and then continued in sales, did some general management of a small company, went to a bigger company, went to a multinational company, did country management for Belgium. So I've been doing that for like 22 years and, and until um, 
uh, Fidi asked me if I wanted to become their secretary general. Before that, I was already involved with Fidi somehow because I was one of the voluntary trainers of the Fidi Academy, which has been there for 30 years, um, which I love doing. I can't do it anymore now. I can't combine the two, which is terrible because I really enjoy doing the academy and training young people. Uh, and I've also been involved in, in the governance of FIDI uh, as a Belgian representative from the from the Belgian FIDI Association. You know, so that's another thing. I'm just going to stop you again. I mean, I'm loving what you're saying, so I'm just going to chime in here. I mean, you're talking about an academy, right? And so many people I've talked to have talked about the need to have an academy for movers and warehousemen. And agents will host their own. Some of them have houses in their warehouse where, you know, you learn how to pack. Yep, I've pack. seen them. You know, obviously you have uh, you have uh, truck driving schools, right, where you get your CDLA, right? Um, there's a there's a driver out there that's that's recruiting uh, drivers and having them ride with him for six months and learning how to be an over the road driver. Yeah. I don't see a widespread, organized, association driven, third party driven, you know standard training out there in the United States. And it, and I think there's a real opportunity for this. Well, we, we have, we, we started off with training move coordinators mostly, so office staff and, and, and some sales staff. And, and later on we did management as well. And these were seminars, meaning on site. So people had to travel and go down to a place and sit down for five days with a couple of trainers and, and be trained on and, and do an exam in the end and hopefully getting a diploma. Um, we did recognize uh, over 10 years ago that, that we couldn't reach all the staff of moving companies. Nobody, not everybody could travel, obviously. So that's when we started our online training. And I think about, um, someone may correct me here, about four years ago, five years ago, uh, absolutely five years ago, we started with the Packers training as well. And, and the Packers training is something that was absolutely needed. And, and I remember when we, were, when we were developing the Packers training, we were sitting down with all the trainers saying, how are we going to do this? Because, you know, a Packer in Belgium Pack slightly different than a packer in US or in Asia. They all have their own methods and they think they do really well. Give me a glimpse. Give me a glimpse into the global, you know, how how are the, how is it different? I mean, I've seen some videos on YouTube of the Japanese movers yeah. that you're just mind blowing. Like Yeah, I know. Yeah. And, and you can't copy that because if suppose that you would go to your Belgian team and you tell them this is how you should be packing. So hell no, we 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 pack differently and we do it very well as well. So it's not a one way to pack things. So what we looked at slightly from a different angle said, okay, let's try to convince them why we need packing, why stuff needs to be packed. And once they realize that, they realize that, hang on, I know what's going to happen to the ship. And it's not just me at origin, but I know it's going to go on a truck or on, on, on sea or on a vessel, it goes to a port, it goes somewhere else, etc. So they see the whole scope and then they realize all the risks in there. How can we make precautions so nothing will break? And if you then make them aware of all those those risks, they will see why they have to pack as thorough as they do um, without telling them exactly how to do it, because that is local after all. And we as a global association, there's not one way how you should pack. Uh, so that's what we build into it at Packers uh, Training, which is an online training for, for packers to do in a group uh, with a, a moderator, if you like, or a facilitator. And as a part two of that, apart from the, 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 the risks of, of, of overseas moving, is of course the, 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 um, uh, how they do their customer service in, in, in a cultural diverse society, very cultural diverse society. The way you come into a house when from people from Singapore is going to be different than when you go into an American house. You know, and people need to be aware of that. Perfect example. I mean, going back to the Japanese, I have so much respect for the way the Japanese uh, operate as movers. You know, there's 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 firms over there that will relocate people over here to the U.S. and they'll actually fly the crew to yeah. the U.S. to do the delivery. That's exactly <laughs> true. Yeah. Mind blowing. And, and, and that is because they, their culture is much more important than for the average American who has a culture but is very flexible in that respect. So, yes, absolutely true. And the same happens over here in Belgium and in Europe. You see uh, Japanese crews flying over, being flown over or having a company here with Japanese staff. Right. Um, and very often they are assisted by local, uh, local people, but uh, the Japanese are in charge. And that is, has to do with culture, definitely. This is fantastic stuff. Um, I'm going to go here and check on our uh, our comments here because they're coming in. Here we've got uh, we've got over 50 people tuned in live here. Let's see, uh, your own uh, your own New York from Flat Rate. Hey, your own, how's it going? Uh, let's see here, John Chris from Now Ship US UK EU, Georgia from Florida, uh, John Hightouse from OK Move Me, Julia O'Connor from Alexandria, Virginia. I believe that's from IAM. Hey, Julia. Yep. Hey, Julia. Eric Bornman watching from the office. Yeah. Arsha Relocations. Hi from India. 
that's great. I don't know if we've had uh, I don't know if we've had Indian viewers yet. We had another one here, Manu uh, from Pune, India. Another Indian. Oh, there we are. Fantastic. See, look, you're bringing them out. You know what? I'm kind of used to that. We we are a very international office. As a matter of fact, I think in our office we have about I think ten or eleven nationalities walking around here uh, and and speaking uh, a, a multitude of, of languages. So it's really fun here. That's great. We got to talk about we got to talk about that diversity and what the benefit is of that too. Um, John Heidhouse from Nashville. Tim Court, my thumbs up and clapping are missing today. Sorry, Tim, with no thumbs. Kunal, uh, hello from Bangalore, India. Another Indian. Maria, Mary O'Donnell, King Relocation, Southern California. Tim Quirk, Atlas World Group International, Rochester, New York. Feedy, Feedy Fame Certified. All right. Hey, good. Thank you. Uh, Atlas. Harsh, Harsha Relocation, Kunal Kaushik. Hey, hi, we are from Vish. Oh, gosh. Visa Kapitam Nam. And he's agent service in India. Yeah, there, somebody's soliciting business in the feed. That's great. <laughs> Any ROI I can give you. Okay, I, hope you get a I hope you get a shit today. Simon Hood. Oh, big question. Oh, we got a question. Okay. Feedy 2020 Osaka. Still planning on going ahead in this location? Not bad. I was expecting that question after 20 minutes already. And exactly 20 minutes. So thank you very much for doing that. Fantastic. Yes, we're going to Osaka for our conference in uh, end of April. And of course, there's many people asking right now, are you still going to Osaka now with what's happening in, in the coronavirus and in, 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 in Asia and actually worldwide? Um, at this time, yes, we are still going. We are, of course, we're monitoring the situation. We're, we're, we're checking the WHO uh, reports every day to see how things are going. Uh, as it stands at this time, uh, we're still going to Osaka. Um, we believe that uh, the virus is serious, but it's being contained as well. Um, so we need to... Um, uh, we uh, uh, take the perception away that it's very dangerous to go to Japan, which is a very safe country as far as hygiene is concerned. And um, so at this time we're going, um, and of course we're monitoring. We've got uh, weekly uh, meetings with our board to 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 check what the status is. Uh, but for now, I'm still heading for Osaka. As a matter of fact, if you can tell, there's our poster right there. I see it. Osaka. Ah, there see you are. it. <laughs> still going. That's awesome. And right. I hope everybody will be there as well. Obviously. Um, you know, for a moment, and I hate to do this transition, but since you brought it up, um, I do want to talk about coronavirus, okay? Um, and what are you seeing or hearing from your membership around the way the coronavirus is impacting shipping and logistics? You know, it, it, it's, it's a difficult one because in general, movers like change in the economy because it brings in business because people start moving around. And, and I remember my, my best years were the years when there was the first Gulf War and all the oil people had to move out of, of Kuwait, which is great for us. And then three months later, we moved them back in. So good business. <laughs> um, in this case, Corona is hitting mostly China, of course, and, and, and that will have an impact on how moves are done or even relocation is done over there. Um, what people can typically expect is that there's going to be delays in, in packing. If you, there's a travel ban and people can't use the traffic as they, uh, they normally do, packing is not going to get started. So there will be big delays there. Uh, same for, for inbound and outbound. The freight uh, the prices are going to increase most likely because there is a lower demand right now to go to China and some ports will close. So that is going to incur demerits and stuff like that. So there's going to be a lot of costs coming up for which the moving companies are not responsible. And then in the end, will probably flow. That cost will probably flow to the customers. So that's that. That's bad news for for those who are going to or from China. On the relocation side, different ball game, but still more or less the same. People are traveling at this time, can't go back to China or can't travel within China at this time. So there's quite a an effect on 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 the business right now, particularly for for the end customers. It should not last too long, and and we are hopeful that it uh, will calm down in the next. Uh, a uh, few weeks, it seems to be contained right now. There's a lot of cases, uh, but there's not that many new cases anymore. We see a slow, uh, the, the growth is slowing more or less. So that's, that's good news. And let's see how it will pan out. Um, it's not good news. No, not for, particularly not for the customers who are stuck there. If you have a coronavirus story or a way that's impacted mobility, relocations, your shipping, anything like that, and you're watching this, if you're watching this and you have any intel on how coronavirus is affecting shipping, please leave it in the comments. I'd love to I'd love to have your, your feedback and anecdotal crowdsource this a little bit. Um, you know, I was talking to a friend of mine who works in logistics for a um, an expedited uh, logistics company, global logistics, NVOCC logistics company, mm -hmm. and they were saying that a lot of shipments are getting, um, you know, I don't know if detains the right word or just halted, and uh, production. You know, he ships a lot of uh, you know, uh, 
he ships a lot of automotive. He ships a lot of general cargo kind of stuff, uh, yeah. just in time type stuff. And uh, you know, they're, they're seeing a, a huge increase in air charters, you know, and the, and the cost of air charters went up 35% over the there weekend. And he thinks they'll probably go up again, another 30% as people rush to make up for the, the backlog. You know, do you think that this is, you know, from a real going back to relocation and household goods, I mean, do you foresee a stall in migration to and from these regions for three months, six months until we sort this out? You know, Ben, it all depends how long it will take. Um, if you remember SARS uh, a number of years back, uh, business was resumed very quickly after SARS calmed down and, and, and the figures went down. Business was resumed instantly and, and, and China has known a big boom in, uh, in, in, in uh, shipments going to and from and the economy as well. So it all depends. If, if, if this goes the same way as SARS went, then I think business will pick up again. Uh, people are very forgetful sometimes on, on how things are happening. So once this has calmed down, I, I'm, I trust it will be back again uh, to normal to normal levels. I'm, I'm, but if it takes long, yeah, then you'll have a devastating effect on the economy. The, the, there's nothing that the economy hates is that like a standstill, uh, nothing happening because nobody's making investments, nobody's doing anything, and that's, that's that's devastating for the economy. But again, I've trust that it will be contained and it will be uh, calming down in the next few weeks. So uh, just a quick little Google search here is telling me 45,000 cases, 1,100 deaths currently confirmed. Um, some people have been comparing it to say just the normal flu virus and saying, well, look how many deaths are with the normal flu. I saw you had commented on that as well on LinkedIn. The thing to me that strikes me is, you know, the flu is around every year all over the world. Correct. And yes, it claims lives from people that are uh, at risk, right? O elderly, people with pre-existing conditions, some small children, maybe I'm not a doctor, so I'm making this up, but, but you know what I mean? And, and so, but I think what, what strikes me about the coronavirus is, is twofold. One, I think it's, I think what I'm hearing is it may have been dramatically underreported in, in China yep. and, and the prevalence of it. Um, although what I'm hearing and reading in the news is that their containments now are showing signs of being effective, which is great. Thank goodness but also that it's claimed so many lives in such an acute region in the world as it, that scares me a little bit. It scares, but still, and, 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 and I feel for, for those who've lost their lives, obviously, but it's still relatively spoken, not too many, if you compare it with flu, for example. And I read that figure of that in the US in, in this winter only, I think 10,000 people died of flu. Something like that, eight or 10. And eight. so far, Corona has killed zero in the US. And, and, right. and I don't want to underestimate Corona. And, and we absolutely need to make sure that we contain it but it is mediatized, obviously, and, and therefore it's blown up bigger than it probably is. I will happily travel to China if needed. Someone will send me to China. I will go there. Nobody needs me there, but I will happily go there because you take your usual precautions. Sure. I love, by the way, that saying you have to wash your hands. I'm like, hey, shouldn't we be doing that in the first place? Always, without or with or without Corona. But anyway, right. so yes, it's probably mediatized a little bit uh, too much, and 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 of course, uh, media jump on this because it's 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 it makes lovely copy, and and people get all excited. Guilty. Guilty. Yeah. Well, there you go. <laughs> hey, guilty too. I, I read the stuff as well, definitely. Um, but perception is, is key in this case. And yeah. I think we need to um, come to a realistic view on things, um, on, on what the real dangers are. And of course, it is important. And of course, we need to contain it somehow. But there are other dangers around in, in this world that need uh, just as much attention. Agreed. Agreed. Mm. Uh, a sensible approach. Thank you. Um, so uh, let's see here. Let's go back to the comments here. Uh, Lisa Baranich uh, from Stevens International, I believe. Hey, Great you keep them coming. Lisa Baranich, Colorado, and a strong advocate and believer in Feedy. Thank you. I know Lisa. Thanks, Lisa. So there you go. Uh, more more requests for shipments into and out of India. <laughs> um, uh, Magli uh, says Lisa Baranich, Feedy is only as good as its members. A little Feedy love going on there in the feed. Yep, I can hear that. That's great. Uh, more solicitations for India shipments. Uh, cheers from Aruba, from Monica Romanowski. Mm -hmm. So we've got Aruba in the house. That's great. Uh, we do have a question here uh, from, uh, I'm going to guess this is Jan Kotz. Does Fidi hold record of origin countries with highest claims ratios? It's a good point, actually. And I'm, I'm glad you touched on that. Yes, we 
actually do, but we've never used those figures. And as a matter of fact, we started a project, um, I think about six months ago, to try to start using that data and, and trying to find out uh, what uh, claims ratios are per country, et cetera, et cetera. So yes, we have those figures, but we've never made them public, but we're working on it and we are going to make it public uh, as soon as we are finished off with um, gathering all the data and putting them in nice uh, presentations. Um, do you, I mean, I'll tell my, my little feedy experience. I had a, a issue with Jordanian customs recently mm -hmm. and uh, the client, well, the shipper was saying that, you know, these requirements or whatever that we're asking for, I think it was uh, proof of a canceled visa and a lease in the country and something else. Right. Yeah. And he's saying, well, these are unreasonable and nobody else is asking for these and whatever. And I went and I actually pulled the Feedy Customs regulations for mm -hmm. uh, for for Jordan, and I sent them to the client, his employer, and I sent them to the shipper, and uh, that helped us. It wasn't the end of the story, but it helped us um, substantiate what we were saying. Okay, and, uh, good for you. It was a fabulous resource. It was very well put together. What other types of documents and resources are, do you put out? Well, you know, customs documents are, are very important, and that's been a there's been there forever that we give customs information on, on all the countries that we have represented and beyond that as well. Um, and, you know, I go back a long time, so I know how it was done in moving. And very often you would say, look, uh, we have ways to custom clear shipments because I know the customs officer, et cetera, et cetera. And very often you would actually, as a mover, tell your agent, we have a way. We don't need that documentation because we have another way to do this somehow. We can't be doing that anymore. So we've actually beefed up our customs documents and tell them exactly what the rules are whether you like it or not, whether you want to go around it or not, we tell you what the rules are. And the same for Jordan, obviously, we, we, we've done that. Um, other stuff that we have, and I think the, one of the most important ones we have currently right now is our professional cooperation guidelines, uh, the PCG, as we call them, which has now also been, been, been um, uh, adopted by both IM and LACMA, so the Latin American Association. Um, we work as agents around the world. We work with each other in a certain way as an origin agent or a booking agent with a destination agent. And Fidi has um, taken the effort to write down exactly how you should be working with each other, how you should professionally work with each other, what are the expectations, minimum at origin, during freight, at destination, where there's claims, where there's invoicing, et cetera, et cetera. This used to be two page document from 40 years back. We've actually gathered around us a number of our affiliates, about 20 of them from all around the world sitting down for a few months every uh, in conference calls don't worry we're not all together and writing those professional cooperation guidelines which are kind of a blueprint on how an operational uh, international move should be operated how you should do that it's now a 30 page document um it's a fantastic if you have a new move coordinator coming in international move coordinator you would give them the document say hey read this if you read this you know what to do with an international shipment and it was so good um, that, that IM reached out to us saying, hey, I know it's your document, but can we use it and can we promote it within IM? And same for Latin uh, LACMA in, in Latin America. Can we use it and promote it and, and say this is the way we should be doing moves internationally? So we still own it. Uh, we write it. Uh, nobody else can touch it. They can use it, but they can't change it. And we're very proud of that document. So those professional cooperation guidelines are a big help uh, for, for international movers. Um, I have a question here from from Terry Head also asking hey, Terry. How, does, how does Feedy work with the other associations such as IM Worldwide ERC? You know, you've mentioned a little bit of some of these collaborative efforts. Yeah, well, we 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 like each other, and 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 it's glad to, glad to hear that from Terry. And I hope Terry's doing well. And I've worked with him for a number of years. Um, we're not really competing with each other because we all have our specialty, if you like. Uh, we are focused on quality and being a global uh, organization. IM is, has a different focus. Uh, LACMA has a different focus. ERC has a different focus. But we do work with each other. We we meet with each other. We invite each other to our conferences so that we can, they can see what we're doing. We can see what they're, they're doing. And the professional cooperation guidelines are a perfect example on how you should be cooperating with each other in this world. I mean, our business, international movement, is not that big, let's face it. If we then start competing on associations with all sorts of stuff, that doesn't really work. Let's try to work together and, and, and make sure that we give tools to the movers so they can provide a better service to the customers. And this is working well with, with, with almost all associations. I don't think we have any issues with any association right now. And we don't intend to. And if you, uh, if you have an issue with Jesse, please leave it in the comments. <laughs> <laughs> Just give me a call. <laughs> <laughs> or give him a call. That'd be the nice thing to do. Yeah. Um, but I, um, I, I wanted to give you a chance also to kind of uh, 
talk about Feeney's value proposition, right? Because you talk about the associations, you talk about, you know, the value to your members and everything. Um, you know, you're a very global organization. I know you have some members in the United States. Um, if, if US, you know, because we are, we are based in the US, although we do have a global reach here. So if US moving companies are watching this or US relocation companies are watching this and they're saying, well, you know, let me understand a little more about Feedy. You know, I know we have AMSA, I know we have IAM, I know we have Worldwide ERC. You know, where does Feedy fit in the mix for me? Should I become a Feedy member? Um, you know, how does how should how, you know why would a why would a moving company in the United States want to become a feedy member and what is the value that they would that they would get out of that? Okay, well, I, I think that, that there's, there's a few reasons why they want to become a feedy member. The, the first one, they need to have international shipments, intercontinental shipments, because that's really our forte. That's where we're focusing on. Mm -hmm. So if you have like two or three a year, that's not going to be enough. That's not going to cut it. It has to be one of your uh, uh, main domains. That's where you do international moving. And let me and let me stop you for one sure. second. Are you talking about you forward your own shipments or you handle OADA services for a ship? It can be both. Um, mm -hmm. You can work through a van line, which which is quite common in the US. And we have members that are member of a, of, of, of a Unigroup, for example, or Atlas. And of course, they can be a, a feeding member because they do origin, they do destination. They don't have to do their own freight. It's not that you have, need to have a forwarding license. That's that's not what we're looking okay. for. But you need to be in control of the shipment uh, of, of your customer. That's important that you have control over the shipment from A to Z with your customer, irrespective of who you use to 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 actually do that that move, which freight company you use or a van line that you may use. So it's important then that you are booking the shipment, that you are yes. the one writing the business. So, you, so yes. if you have international customers, you can be an agent, you don't have to be a forwarder, you can use other forwarders, but it's important that you are booking the business and it is international. And, and Correct. Uh, we do accept, of course, that people are not always bookers. There's countries where almost nobody is a booker, but they have done bookings and, and, and they still do to an extent, but they are more an origin and destination agent. And then the reason, I think the main reason you want to become part of Feedy, because you have that great network of Feedy, which you can find elsewhere as well. I, I totally agree. But all like-minded companies, they've all gone through that, that fame audit. They all work against certain principles with the professional cooperation guidelines, the, 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 the fame standard. And that gives a kind of ease of working with each other. You know what we're talking about. It's the same terminology that we use, the same uh, metrics that we use. And that is really making life a lot easier. On top of that, uh, and apart from the networking and, 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 and the fame accreditation, you get the training, obviously, in the academy. You also get our payment protection. And, and I know I am at the payment protection. We had it already 30 years back, uh, where we've built up a great uh, fund. It's called the FASI Fund. And, and this is our payment protection in case one of your agents, for, for whatever reason, is, is going out of business or is, or is terminated as a feeding member, you can still claim those invoices from the FASI fund and get payout from 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 from. Well, I think that's sure. really important. I want to go back to that because I think that's really important. Because I mean, you're talking about how do you trust someone across the globe that maybe you've never met before, right? Correct. Yeah. And knowing not only that they hold a certain level of standards, which has been audited by a third party, but knowing that your your receivables is also guaranteed and protected. I mean, at the end of the day, we want to get we want to do good work and we want to get paid. Right. Yeah, which is also good for the customer in the end. Hey, if you know you're going to get paid, and you don't need to worry about that invoice that you that, that, that for your destination services. Then you will deliver the customer because you know that either you'll be paid by the mover. And if something would happen and you've reported usually to 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 the FASI system, then FIDI will indeed pay out and, and, and cover that invoice uh, for you. Well, so that's, that's the a number very one strong reason. Number. That's the number one reason the shipments are, are held hostage. It's not because we Correct. form these emotional attachments to your household goods. Yeah. It's because people want to actually get paid paid and that's the only leverage that yeah, have, yes. so. people so want to get paid and of course we also have a dispute resolution um, or mediation if you like kind of arbitration uh, for in case there are any issues between movers uh, feeding movers then we have a, a whole committee here that will uh, look into that and come to a conclusion which will then be binding of course so there's a number of things that we do um, and, and i think the conference is also one of them which is uh, very big for us obviously uh, we have a 39 club for the youngsters in our in our in our midst and and well young i mean 39 is not that young Otherwise, I'm, I would be very old, uh, but it's a, it's a fun club and, and, and they, they, they do a lot of good things and, and they, a lot of charity that they are involved in and, and uh, projects they are starting. And very often people from the 39 Club even become president. If you look at uh, Freddie Paxton, he used to be uh, in the 39 Club, in the board of 39 Club and, and is now has been president of FIDI uh, until a year ago. So how long was how long ago was it that Freddie Paxton was in the 39 Club? You're looking for pictures? I got loads of pictures on. <laughs>
<laughs> we just like that fun. I it can't share good. them. GDPR, you know, can't share them. <laughs> GDPR. Yeah. You know, that's actually a great a great segue into GDPR. Um, that was one of the questions that I had, right? Because here we are, um, we are, and I'm going to let this Feedy conference, uh, you know, plug go along the bottom there for Thank you. you. Okay. I get I get a royalty on everybody that signs up during the. Uh, <laughs> from now, okay. <laughs> um, no, I'm just kidding. But um, GDPR, right? So this is something. Here we are sitting in the U.S. Europe goes out and they institute GDPR, and it's very wide ranging in scope. Correct. And it basically says, it, and correct me if I'm wrong, but if you touch a European individual um, mm -hmm. or, or ever handle their information or ever, you know, saw one in person, then you have to make, you basically have to protect the, the information at this certain level of standard. Okay. Correct. Um, and uh, the American companies, when this came out are like, this is very, you know, far reaching here. And, and I don't know that I can adhere to this. And I don't even know that it's financially viable. And is this really serious? And, is this even enforced? I mean, is this even enforceable, uh, Jesse? And is this something that American companies have to take take seriously? I think they should take it seriously. As a matter of fact, that the EU has now started by 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 auditing and also by imposing fines on certain companies. And some fines have been shared already, not only with European companies but companies worldwide. Whoever they touch, EU citizens, and they do not protect the data, mm -hmm. personal data of that EU, EU citizens, like the way they should. Um, don't forget, there is a noble cause behind this. It is protection of personal data. I think that's a good thing. Um, yeah. uh, Europe has seen uh, the, 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 the evolution and the development in personal data trading that is happening all around the world, and they've chosen to the protect their, their, their citizens. And they've therefore installed GDPR, which is now live and real, is absolutely being enforced uh, gradually, of course. But then again, and, and I remember when, when it started, and we had a couple of our American uh, affiliates um, uh, asking lawyers what they should be doing and coming back with bookworks of uh, 20 or to 30 pages to read and to sign that you're protecting data, et cetera, et cetera, in all legal lingo that nobody really understood what was going on. And you have to tone down a little bit because don't forget that we are in, we're trading moves. We're not trading personal data. Mm -hmm. We're not Google, we're not Amazon. We don't have a lot of data. We have a bit of data, sure we have, but they're, we're, they're not focusing on us. We're not the bad guys. We have some data and we just need to make sure that we, uh, if we keep it, that we have a good reason why we keep it, that it's all um, uh, clearly processed, that we have all those processes ready and, and, and public for if, if, if people uh, will want to audit it, that we delete it if they want it. That's the kind of stuff that you need to do. And I think it's a good thing. And, and, and even as Feedy, we have personal data of people as well. I mean, in our, in our database. Yes, absolutely. This is where we looked at right away. So, okay, what, can, what are the rules? And, and get some people together in your company, start assessing where you are and what you need to do. It is not so, Ben, that, that, that the EU authorities are going to you know, do a dawn raid in your company to check what you're doing. They probably will only react to a complaint. If there's a complaint, they will definitely will react to it. They will come in and check out. But without that, it, it's not going to happen right away, of course. But it's still a good principle. It's still a noble cause. And it's, again, something that you can sell to your customers and tell them, hey, guys, we, we applied GDPR to the letter and, and we make sure that your data is protected and, and disposed of whenever we think it should be disposed of according to your wishes. Have there been any have there been any moving companies or even logistics companies that you're aware of that have gotten ensnared in the GDPR complaints? No, not yet. No, not, not yet. yet. They're looking for companies dating and uh, trading in data, of, of course. That's mm -hmm. where they, they're looking for, and, and, and movers are not doing that. Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, in our fame, we already included the 80% of the GDPR principles uh, six years ago. Uh, so way before GDPR set in, we already included that in fame, and we beefed it up in the last version uh, a year, at the start of a year ago. So those who are in, in, in FIDI, they've got their GDPR for about 90% covered. Whether they're in Europe or not, they already have it covered. So uh, staying in Europe, I want to talk to you about Brexit, right? Mm -hmm. So this has been a pretty hot topic. It's been it was it was really hot when it came out. Gosh, what a year, two years ago, almost it feels like it came three out. Years, three years. Three years now. Yes, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And um, so here we are. What's really happening? You know, what's the impact? <laughs> It's fun because, uh, you know, the 31st of January, um, Brexit happened all of a sudden and the, the, the UK left uh, the EU. And my heart still bleeds when I hear say that because I'm, I'm a true European in that respect. So I feel very sorry for them to see them leave. And, and of course, it's their decision and I respect that. Um, but in practice, nothing happened on the 31st of January. They indeed left. 
but all the principles of, of, of EU is, are still applicable until the end of the year, in December, I believe, when we need to have a new trade deal. So right now, nothing is changing. Well, except for the UK, they no longer have uh, a voice within Europe, so they can't influence any decisions anymore. But all the laws for the EU are still applicable to them up until they have a, we have a new trade deal in, in December. And this is important, of course. If there's no real trade deal, then it's going to be a little bit chaotic, I think. And we don't know exactly what's going to happen. So we have uh, high hopes, and, and I think both the EU and UK are working very hard now to come to a trade deal by the end of, of this year. Um, you know, um, when I told you earlier, when movers like change, because it brings extra revenue. So if, if Brexit would have been voted and happened overnight, yes, there would have been a lot of business for movers all of a sudden, of moving people out and in because of that Brexit. The, the worst thing that could happen to the movers at that time was that standstill that we've had for three years when nothing was happening and there was uncertainty whether Brexit would actually happen or not and when it would happen and how it would happen. That standstill was not good for movers, definitely. And, and I feel for our, our, our colleagues in the UK and some in Europe as well, that they were there was no extra traffic coming. As a matter of fact, many companies were no longer investing in the UK or in Europe because they didn't know what was going to happen at that time. Uh, un uncertainty is the worst, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Standstill is, is bad. So in that respect, the fact that the 31st of January has happened and that, that, we, and that by, by December there will be hopefully a trade deal is actually good news for movers because that standstill will be over and no doubt there will be business opportunities coming, as well as some challenges. I mean, I go back to the years before the open borders in the EU and we had to custom clear stuff going into UK or to Italy or whatever. That's going to happen again now. Goods coming into UK will have to be custom cleared and that will take time and some logistical issues. Well, well hey, movers can can do this. We've done this before, and I'm sure that, that they will cope with that uh, without uh, big issues. Uh, so yes, there will be some opportunities for some companies um, because of Brexit happening, finally happening now, and that's good news. But again, in my heart, I'm bleeding. Do, and do you do you, I mean do you foresee decreased volumes of mobility be, between UK? I mean, have you seen that? Do you forecast that, or do you think it'll, it'll bounce back? No, I, I don't think so. And again. If there are changes, then, then movers will profit from it because moves are going to happen all of a sudden, either going out of the UK or coming into the UK. So, no, I, I don't think so. In, in the long run, it will probably pan out. There will be a bit of chaos in the first few years. Maybe one element that could be not good for the UK is the groupage shipments. Many groupage containers would come into the UK because you could custom clear that for the whole of Europe, and then they would you know, distribute it over Europe. That is no longer possible, so that means they have to custom clear in those countries, which is a bit of a hindrance. So it could be that some groupage containers will go directly into Europe to Rotterdam or Antwerp or La Havre in, 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 in the UK. So instead of like Southampton, they'll go into Rotterdam or something like that. And yeah, correct. Just, yeah, could be. So, so port traffic could be down, which, you know, is obviously not a good thing, right? I mean, you want your ports. Uh, let's see here. We got a question here from uh, John Krish. How is Feedy addressing CCPA? Many companies in the U.S. are adhering to these regulations. CCPA, if you're not familiar, maintains rules on sales, but it also protects personal data loss issues. Correct. Yeah, this I thought about that it. A customer who has origin domiciled or de destination domiciled have very strong protections. Is Feedy aware? Yeah, we are aware of CCPA and, and, and we've looked into it indeed, and I believe it's effective as of 2020. Um, it is a bit similar to our GDPR, but not as strong. I, I'm not an authority on this, so it's not that I can give you an whole expose about this. Um, but it is, and that's what, as a matter of fact, that's what we're seeing with, with GDPR, that many uh, authorities and countries are now copying it, are copying whatever we've done in Latin America. There are a few countries, and I think particularly Brazil, are looking into their uh, privacy laws, and they're copying whatever the European Union is doing. So if, if, if California is doing that, you know, you never, may, maybe one day the whole of US will be, we will be taking this up. So it's, it's, it looks a bit like, like GDPR, but it's, it's, it's less strong. Excellent. What else is going on out there in the, in the global mobility world from your perspective uh, that you think people need to be aware of? Well, I, I guess you all know this. Um, uh, when I started, we had our typical career uh, diplomat or career expat moving around with uh, starting with a small shipment and then with a 20 foot. And as every child would have another uh, half a container. So by the time after 30 years of touring around the world, they came back with two or three 40 foot containers. Those were the fantastic opportunities for movers back then with lots of shipments going around. And we all know that 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 um, our current customer, or it's changing, that, that that demographics are changing, that we're seeing customers with moving around with less stuff. 
Um, I had one of my employees not too long ago who uh, moved to London. And I said, do you need help with your move? He said, no, what move? He said, well, you know, your goods, your stuff. She said, I don't have any goods. So what do you mean? You've got some stuff. You, you live with stuff. He said, so where's your home? Your home is where your goods are. And she said, you know, my home is where my iPhone charger is. And that is kind of you know, daunting for me, like as, as a slightly older person, they don't attach that, that, that value anymore to, to worldly goods like we did. So the demographics are changing and you can see that average shipment uh, volume or, or weight going down. Uh, and that is something that we need to cope with. At the same time, there are more customers because people are getting more mobile. So we just have to get used to those smaller shipments and therefore groupage is, is, is a great way, thing to look into, I think, as a mover. Um, uh, more customers, but a little bit smaller, smaller entitlements, uh, smaller moves. Explain, explain the concept of groupage to our Americans. Okay, groupage um, uh, or consolidation, if you like, is where you do not book your own container, but basically you ask uh, your mover to to consolidate your smaller shipment, a thousand pounds, two thousand pounds, with other uh, mo uh, uh, people moving to the same area. So it's not a, a mixture of, of 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 different goods with each other, like uh, machinery and 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 removal goods and and iPhones. It's all removal goods into one container where you share the the cost of the container. It's a, a cheaper way to move. Of course, it's not your own container, so you're not completely in control of when it arrives and when it will, 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 will be delivered. Um, but it is a, a, a very effective way, and particularly our lump sum customers like that, that way of, uh, of moving, because it's smaller shipments. And, and as there are smaller shipments, there will be more opportunities for groupage, no doubt. So you mentioned a couple of things I want to also ask you about. Are you seeing shipment volumes going up, going down, or staying the same? Going down. Going down. So you're saying, uh, show. let me rephrase, let me rephrase, not volumes, ah, okay, sure. um, quantity. I think that that's going up because there's more and more people mobile nowadays. And, and it's, it's very accessible as well for, for many people to, to go out and, and go to another country. So I, I see that going up and, and you can see by the number of expats or uh, semi-expats going around the world, it's, it's a growing number. Uh, more countries are opening up their borders for, for this kind of business. So the, 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 the globalization of business will absolutely bring more people around the world, but their, their, their profile has changed dramatically. And, and, and the care that a, a traditional expert of 20 years ago or 30 years ago got that kind of care is slightly changing a little bit. That's why you have those lump sum customers where they basically give an envelope to the customer saying, hey, sort it out yourself and, and make sure you're there in three weeks and we'd love to see you start working there. So, uh, so I want to I want to touch on this, right? So in the United States, we report domestic shipments, AMSA reports, that domestic shipments are decreasing, they say anywhere between two to five percent annually compounded for the last decade plus. And I wonder about this data, but you're telling me that you're seeing shipment quantities, frequency uh, increasing. Um, is there, you know, I, I find it interesting, right? So here in, within the US, and, and I think a lot of times it, uh, us Americans, we, we think of ourselves as indicative of the whole world or as the center of the universe, right? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a big part of the business, I can tell you, the US, yeah. it's 50%, I reckon. But I wonder, I wonder why our shipments are going down here domestically in, in, within our borders, but, um, but would you hazard a guess as to why maybe the, they're going up internationally, globally? It's, it's a good question. I, I, I wish I had the answer. And as we're collecting data in, in our project, we probably will be able to, to answer this better in a few, uh, in a few months. Okay. Um, I think it has to do with the demographics and, and how people are. And, and, and I see it with my own children, how international they are and, and how easy they change jobs, just not from one city to another, but to go to another country for now and then. That's always helpful. And, and that's something that uh, it will enhance their career in a way. It helps their career. So, yes, I, I, I do see it going up and not massively and we don't know how it's going to pan out in the next few years i mean maybe stuff like uh, coronavirus will, will will make people reconsider and say hey maybe i want to stay home i don't want to go to certain countries that's also possible that may change same by the way for for the volume of shipments and and we're all saying that the millennials have smaller volumes to move who says that it's going to remain this way those millennials get older and as they get older, they may start collecting stuff. And maybe it will no longer be IKEA stuff, but you know, nice and antique stuff, art stuff. You never know. So yeah. we don't know how that's going to evolve. And, and, and I'll be curious to see that. The, the movers well, have, are not done it, yet, I think. It is interesting because I'm seeing a shift now with um, 
so I'm a millennial technically. And I bought my first house two years ago mm -hmm. and I started to fill it. I bought some Ikea stuff, but I also bought some nice pieces, you know, some real heavy stuff that I've just paid off. Thank God, you know, and some big old refrigerators and big, you know, tables that seat like 10 people for Thanksgiving and whatever. And, uh, you know, I'm definitely collecting those pieces that I hope I keep for 10, 20, 30 years of passed down to my kids. Sure. Um, so I see that I'm also seeing, uh, you know, people starting to do like get into woodworking and weird hobbies like this. Young people, they're getting more into craftsmanship, mm -hmm. uh, which is kind of an interesting turn. They're building these farm tables and they're working with their hands and stuff. So I'm seeing some of these things to your point where it's like, is this a trend where they're just young and they're growing up and then all of a sudden they're going to be like their parents. You know, a lot of us grow up to be like our parents, whether we like it or not, you know. Absolutely true. And, and I think just the value will go up probably. Uh, so yeah. less the good, but the value will go up and therefore the need for better packing and, and better protection is, is, is there as well. So we need to keep on working on the training mm -hmm. and make sure that we know how to pack those, 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 those new, new type of goods. Yeah. And the last question I'm going to ask you, uh, mm -hmm. just because you mentioned it twice now, and it's such a hot topic here in the U.S., is lump sum mm -hmm. and you mentioned lump sum and you know it's something that's been happening here in the u.s and some people kind of bury their head in the sand and pretend it's not happening some people you know think it's not a big deal uh and then the, you know but i think it's a really big deal because i uh, not only does um it obviously change it changes the way people purchase moving services yeah. and it becomes a lot more fragmented and it increases the cost of acquisition of these customers. Now they're going on Google and it introduces a whole new element of uh, moving scams and brokers into the business. That Correct. We've yeah. before. I'd like to understand your perspective from a European and a global perspective. What are you seeing around lump sums? Uh, you know, lump sums, is, again, it's, it's something that has been uh, came up a few years back. And I think there's a difference between domestic lump sums and international lump sums. Domestic, it's, it's relative. If you're an American, you move from Texas to, to, to whatever, Orlando, you can do that yourself. It's not that difficult after all. You're an American. You're an American. You, you speak English. Stop, you should be stop, stop. No, you can't do it yourself. You have to hire me. Don't stop. <laughs> Sorry. No, I mean, you can deal with this. You can find your own mover and make no, sure that you do this. If it's international, there's also something called duty of care of your yeah. employer. Um, suppose you send someone to China or to any other country, let's take Singapore for a change, and, and you tell them, hey, you do go do your own visa immigration. And they screw up and they're going to end in jail, which happens sometimes, then you as an employer, you're responsible for that. Whether you've given them an envelope or not, you're responsible. That's your duty of care because you can't expect a, an American or a European to go to Singapore and know their way around. So yes, there, there, there have been those lump sum customers and they're, they're not going to go away. They, they're, st they're still going to be there. But I do believe that the corporate customers, the corporate accounts, their employers are actually seeing the dangers of this as well. I'm well, I, I'd important. argue, though, Jesse, I'd argue that there's still a duty of care for for intra country shipment. I mean, yeah, you I mean, know more than I do. I mean, I, I would. I mean, granted, the stakes aren't as high. You move to Orlando and you don't do it right, you're not going to get thrown in jail. You're not going to get deported back to Texas. That's fair. Right. That is very fair. No, but suppose you pick a wrong mover <laughs> and you can't get into your house because the mover goods yeah. are not there. Yeah. You're going to a hotel. Who's going to fork yeah. the hotel charges? Who's yeah. going to pay for the clothing that you need? And you're not going to be in the office for a few days, so you're not being productive. There's a whole yes. series of, of results of doing it badly. So I do think that the corporate customers, the, the, the employers, are still getting those envelopes, but at the same time, they're going to impose certain levels of, 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 of their supply chain, who they should be working with. So that's an evolution that you will see. Otherwise, it just gets too risky for them. Are you seeing the same proliferation of moving scams from online based Internet moving companies that we're seeing in the U.S.? Not to that extent. We see it everywhere happening, but not to the extent of the U.S. at, at this time. It's a bit more over there, and you do see horror stories about this as well, uh, with, with uh, holding a, a good hostage for a while, etc. That we don't see that often in, in Europe, but it's getting here as well. Don't don't worry. We'll, we're going to have that kind of stuff in, 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 in globally as well, definitely. Well, Absolutely. I mean, the barrier to entry, right? You can just find a truck somewhere and become, you know, Correct. claim to be a mover, you know, and drive somebody to Orlando. There's there's not an ocean between you and you can't just get a U-Haul if you're going internationally. That's, that's sure. right. And they're all quality, right? <laughs> right. Exactly. We're all quality. That's right. That's right. Um, we've got a couple of comments here uh, just to wrap up here. Stephen Meyer, thank you, Ben, for bringing all these experts in their specialized segments of our industry. 
These interactions between you and them has opened my eyes to vast issues and solutions that an ordinary van operator never fathomed. Thank you again, Love and Reload. It's very enlightening. Good. Thanks. I was so happy to have you on, Jesse, because, um, you know, you bring a new perspective, you know. Yeah. It's, it's I appreciate great. the opportunity. It's, 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 it's great. As you can see, I'm quite passionate about Fidi and about our business. Uh, so, yeah, it, it's, it's great to be able to share that with you guys. Yeah. Well, at that note, um, Jesse, is there anything else you want to say as we wrap here? Yeah, come to Osaka. Everybody who's a Fidi member, come to Osaka. It's going to be fabulous. But thank you for making promotion for that. Thank you, Ben. Yeah, my, my pleasure. And uh, thank you so much again for coming on. It's been fantastic. Um, and then uh, just tomorrow, I just want to plug, if anybody's still watching here, and it looks like we have a bunch. we got 75 people watching live on LinkedIn cool. right now. Um, I do want to plug uh, Jennifer Breen uh, is going to be on Friday, president of Sweet Home Chicago. And Holly Klontz from Ingersoll Rand is going to be on talking about getting a seat at the table tomorrow on Thursday. So, uh, Jesse, thank you so much for taking time out of your evening to be with us. It means the world. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And I'll go head home and it's time for the bar. <laughs> Wonderful. Have one on me. <laughs> Take care.